morning, everyone. So just let me begin by sharing a short video with everyone. Morning, Kathleen. Good morning, Lisa. Morning. Hi, Tito. Good morning. <laughs> Morning, Tito. Yes. Double down uh, on our efforts to catch up with uh, science and technology and innovation. Science and technology and innovation, these are indispensable in the modern economy, in the modern world. Uh, the problem being that, you know, while uh, we have our uh, PhDs here, there aren't enough of us. And um, everywhere else in the world, for research to be successful, you need a complete research group. It's very important that the uh, PASA members and um, scientists based in the Philippines are continuously in contact, so we will know the needs of you know, the Filipinos and opportunities um, that the Filipinos can have to uh, do science um, with their PASA counterparts. I think um, that is one of the good programs that they keep on supporting some of the initiatives of our researchers and scientists here in the country. The role of this uh, cooperation among these government agencies really is to be able to attract uh, science and technology global-based companies to set up shop here. And that is really key in terms of developing the science and technology innovation ecosystem in the country. We really need to ratchet up the appreciation, the recognition of the importance of science and technology and innovation. And um, we are all um, trying to uh, uh, attain what we call uh, the common good. The the greater, higher, long-term good of the Filipino people. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this Friday morning in our usual Paase webinars. So for those of you who are new and are just joining us for the first time, so we are from the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering. Um, we are a group of Filipino scientists and engineers uh, based here in the Philippines as well as in the U.S. And we've now expanded to um, other parts of the, of the world, such as um, Australia. So uh, for this morning, we're having our uh, Paase webinar. And to introduce our speaker for today, I'd like to call on uh, the current president um, to introduce our speaker, Professor Gisela Concepcion. Thanks, uh, Kay. Greetings, everyone. It is my great honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker today, a dear friend and colleague. Dr. Lisa Grace Versales is Professor of Statistics at the University of the Philippines School of Statistics in Diliman and currently serves as Vice President for Planning and Finance of the UP system. Dr. Versales earned her bachelor's, master's, and PhD in statistics in UP Diliman, and she wrote her PhD dissertation and attended courses in the University of Pennsylvania in the US. Dr. Bersales is the first national statistician of the Philippines and served in this capacity from 2014 to 2019, heading the Philippine Statistics Authority. During this period, she was also the Philippines Civil Registrar General and started the implementation of the Philippines National Identification System. She implemented the Philippine Statistical Act of 2013 in the creation of the Philippine Statistics Authority. She also served in the following capacities, co-chair of the United Nations Statistical Commission's Interagency Expert Group 
for Sustainable Development Goals Indicators, Vice Chair of the Regional Steering Group for Civil Registration and Vital Statistics, Decade for Asia and the Pacific, Chair of the Advisory Council to the UN Statistical Institute for Asia and the Pacific, Chair of the Executive Committee of the Partnership in Statistics for Development in the 21st Century, or Paris 21, and President of the Philippines Professional Society of Statisticians, the Philippine Statistical Association Incorporated. She is currently a board member of the Open Day Watch, a member of the Thematic Research Network for Data and Statistics, or TRENDS, of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and she is in the editorial team of the Statistical Journal of the International Association of Official Statistics. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you Dr. Lisa Grace S. Versales. Thank you so much, dear Giselle. Uh, it's always to be good. It's always good to be with Paase. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be with you again. Uh, I see a lot of good friends uh, with us in the Zoom room. Thank you so much for being here. My topic today is actually uh, a suggestion that Giselle himself, herself um, uh, gave when she invited me to uh, present to the Zonta uh, ladies. And she, of course, because of that, I thought of how do I make gender data interesting? We now are in this situation where we want to be able to present data in more interesting ways. Gone are the days when we present them just showing statistical tables, thousands of them. Uh, we now want to be able to provide data visualization for more appreciation and data stories. So the focus now especially of official statisticians, is data use. Whereas before it was data generation, put out all of the statistical tables and let the users decide how to you know, understand them. So today, and I'm very pleased that uh, the former uh, uh, chair of CHED, uh, Dr. Dequanan is with us because this is her advocacy. I'm going to tell you a story. And this is the story of the typical Filipina. And when I say typical, it comes from official statistics. So this is the story. Before I go there though, let me just be very specific about how I produced the data story about this typical Filipina. So uh, this comes from the population census of 2015. Just last week, the Philippine Statistics Authority released the population census and housing results for 2020. Also this story, benefits from the National Demographic and Health Survey of 2017, the Labor Force Surveys 2018 to 2020, the Survey on Overseas Filipinos 2018, some administrative records of TESDA, and data from the registers of the civil registration system, uh, which are the civil registration and vital statistics. I would also like to acknowledge uh, illust the illustrator of my stories. So I want to introduce to you Juana Filipina. 
This is her story. Where does she live? If she were in a community of 100 people, these people would be, most of them, in the urban areas. Usually they are in the zone. And proportion would be 51 male and 49 female. Religion would be mostly Roman Catholic. In terms of literacy, 98 of the 100 are able to read and write. And most of them have high school education. And most of them too are single. So this is Juana Filipina's community. Who is Juana? Juana is 30 years old. She's married. She has three children and their names are Nathaniel, Althea, and James. When Juana gave birth to her children, she gave birth in a health facility. She also was able to breastfeed her children upon birth. And her children were, were given vaccination shots. And she did them because of the advocacy of her community. Her community encouraged birth giving birth in health facilities, breastfeeding children, and having the children, their vaccination shots as soon as in, within the first year of life. Juana has high school education. And she works, so she's employed, in the services sector. If she had gone to college, which she wasn't able to, she would have taken a business administration course. Or if she went the route of Tibet, technical vo vocational education, she would have taken courses, trainings related to tourism. If only she had the choice, she would have wanted to also go overseas as an overseas Filipino worker. And if she did, her place or has de her destination country would have been in the Middle East, the United Arab Emirates. Juana is very happy to be living in her community. And this is because she feels empowered. But what is empowered for her? Juana is able to decide how she wants to spend her earnings. She has her own cell phone. And she is also able to participate in deciding about what she wants for her household. And if she wants to go visit her relatives and her friends, she's able to do so. She heard that in other countries, the women, especially wives, cannot just decide on such things, they have to first get the approval of their husbands. And that is not how Juana experiences her life. Thus, 
she considers herself an empowered woman. A very important message she has to other women in these other countries is if she doesn't want to have intimate relations with her husband, she can say no. One, however, still have issues, still has issues. She still doesn't have her own bank account. She doesn't have ownership either jointly with others of land in the same manner she doesn't have her own house. So she lacks these assets. Now Juana worries about her only daughter, Althea. It's because she has seen that in her community, so many teenagers like her daughter have become pregnant. She also sees sexual violence happening against her neighbors, other women. And the sexual violence takes the form of being not just of physic experiencing physical violence, but also emotional violence. And interestingly, these experiences of these other women of violence come from those closest to them. Some of them actually even coming from their own mothers. So both sexual and physical violence against women. And that is not the life that she wants for her daughter. Having a husband that can give her this type of experiences is not what she wants for Althea. Talking about attitudes. She is perplexed when some of her neighbors actually say that wife beating is justified. And the reasons why these neighbors say that wife beating is justified is because the wife burned the family's food. She went out without asking permission from her husband. She argued with her husband. She neglected her children, and she refused sexual intimacy with her husband. Other privileges that Juana enjoys, which she has heard are not enjoyed by women in other countries, is freedom to access legal documents, establishing her and her children's identities, without asking permission from anyone. She can go to the concerned government agencies to be able to access these legal documents by herself without any authorization from anyone. Specifically, her birth certificate and her children's birth certificate. Also now, she can go and have registration to get a national ID. And in fact, she can even deny information about her civil status. So if she doesn't want in the national ID, her being married to be registered, she has the right to do so. Friends, Juana Filipina is the typical Filipina. Her experience is the experience of the majority of Filipinas. I gave this data story and stories about Juana to emphasize that we have rich data 
from government, specifically from the Philippine Statistics Authority. And they were important in prioritizing advocacies for government. As you have heard, I highlighted teenage pregnancy as a very uh, grave issue now. What I did was provide you data stories about Juana. I didn't even go into analytics. So with the rich data available, one could do more analytics. Why? Why is it that the neighbors of Juana Filipina, you know, agree for women to be beaten by their husbands? What is happening to this community? Why do some women seem to accept such a situation? I mentioned already for me of concern are teenage pregnancies. Another would be perpetrators of victims of sexual and physical violence. And the story of Juana's neighbors is that the perpetrators are close to the women, their husbands or partners, even their mothers, mothers-in-law and other relatives. I always point this out to my friends, social scientists asking the question, what is this culture that our women seem to be exposed to? So friends, that is the story of Juana Filipina. I just want to share with you that her story came from the website of the Philippine Statistics Authority. I just grabbed all of those information. And interesting uh, data visualizations that you can see there are uh, information from the Civil Registration and Vital Statistics System. The Philippine Statistics Authority collects uh, uh, babies' names when they are registered at birth. And in 2018, the most common baby names are Nathaniel, Althea, Samantha, Jacob, James, Princess, Angel, and this table actually shows uh, more details. I just like to point out uh, interestingly that most common baby names are biblical. Nathaniel, James, Jacob, Gabriel, Joshua. While most common baby girl names in my mind are more the princess type of names, uh, Althea, Samantha, Angel, Angela, Princess, Sophia. And uh, the Philippine Statistics Authority actually notes that uh, it seems the sources of these names come from beauty queens, uh, 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 from uh, celebrities. But in my mind, is there something Behind this, again, I go back to this uh, culture. Is, does, do these baby names say something about the mindset of parents? Uh, do they mean that they would expect their uh, boys, their male children, to really uh, be religious or to be pillars of the family in terms of uh, character with a character coming from the Bible? How about the baby girls, the female children? Are they expecting the parents? Are they expecting their children 
to be physically beautiful, uh, to be in the entertainment industry or go into beauty pageants? If, if that is the case, is this the kind of culture that we want for our children? Uh, before we had our uh, webinar, I had the pleasure of chatting with the uh, chair uh, Liquanan and Giselle, and we talked about education in, this, in the Philippines. Uh, and for me, this may be uh, related to, to that. Another source of information that I got uh, is from the National Demographic and Health Survey. Uh, this survey is usually done every three years. Uh, this is the source of information uh, that we have on uh, maternal and health, on uh, so fertility, trans infertility, uh, age of women, when they have first sexual intercourse, when they have their first marriage, and when they first give birth. So as you can see, uh, as of uh, 2017, when the latest National Demographic and Health Survey was conducted, uh, uh, total fertility rate, which is the total number of births a woman would have by the end of her childbearing period is 2.7. So this means that if you have uh, uh, 10 women, then you would have 27 children. Uh, and fertility has been declining in the Philippines. It was 4.1 in 1993, and it's 2.7 in 2017. And that is why uh, if, if you actually look also at the uh, household uh, uh, size uh, in the Philippines or family size, uh, usually you would have uh, five, uh, five members in the family. Uh, as I've mentioned earlier, I would like to, uh, uh, you know, give attention to uh, teenage pregnancy. Uh, as you can see in this visualization, uh, 15 to 19 years, year old women, 9% uh, would have already begun childbearing. They are typically in rural areas, uh, these uh, teenage pregnancies. And if you look at uh, the map of the Philippines showing uh, teenage pregnancies, you would see that the highest occurrence is in Mindanao, specifically in Davao region, and the lowest occurrence is in uh, Luzon, uh, specifically in the Bicol region. And as regards uh, family planning, 54% of women uh, 54% of them would, uh, would, who are currently married aged 15 to 49 actually use some method of contraception. And there is an increase in the use of modern uh, contraceptive methods with the uh, uh, commonly used family planning methods, uh, the pill, uh, uh, that's the uh, modern uh, method. As to work, and economic participation, I would like to point your attention to uh, labor force participation rate of women. This was in 2017, but actually the latest labor force surveys would uh, have similar uh, picture, especially with the pandemic. Uh, the Philippine Statistics Authority actually now conducts the labor, labor force survey on a monthly uh, basis, whereas before the pandemic, uh, this is done uh, uh, quarterly. And uh, I believe the PSA is doing this to support the need of government to know what's going on uh, with our uh, uh, citizens in terms of uh, labor force, uh, looking closely at the informal sector. And so you can see that in 2017, uh, only 46.2% women participate in labor force. And when we say participate in labor force, they are worth uh, uh, seeking whether, even if they are unemployed, 
they are seeking employment. So they would be still considered part of the labor force. So that's 46.2% versus 76.2%. Uh, uh, for me, this is something to look into because there are many studies that have shown, uh, research studies that have shown that increasing labor force participation rate of women in the country uh, in, in, is uh, highly associated with the country's uh, gross domestic product. So there is more of uh, uh, economic activity in the country. Uh, furthermore, with labor force participation rate of women, uh, fertility rate actually reduces. Uh, so the, the, it is actually very important for women to be gainfully part of the uh, uh, labor force. Uh, I, I say that uh, uh, without you know, uh, saying that the role of women in the household, women who have decided to be fully uh, uh, working in the household without pay, so, so they are the uh, house makers. Uh, they are usually, they are not considered part of the labor force if they don't uh, look for work. And underemployment, of course, we know that during the pandemic, uh, underemployment, unemployment and underemployment uh, increased, uh, but there is now a decreasing trend, I know, in the past uh, months of unemployment, but underemployment is still an issue. Uh, underemployment means that even if the worker is uh, employed, uh, he or she still seeks more hours of work. Uh, most of the unpaid family workers, so the uh, Labor Force Survey of the Philippines captures unpaid work. Most of unpaid family workers are the women. And uh, as mentioned already, Awana uh, worked on in retail, so usually the women uh, labor force are in the retail uh, business, uh, in services actually, while uh, the men are usually in agriculture. So some of the stories about Wana came from this uh, uh, information about economic participation of women in the Philippines. And uh, uh, violence uh, against women. Uh, there are many sources of uh, statistics, uh, but the National Demographic and Health Survey actually also captures them. Uh, ma the main um, source would be administrative records from the PNP. And so uh, this is another concern. Although uh, the Philippines is among the countries in the world who have really good laws and uh, uh, policies to protect women and children against violence, there are still uh, such cases uh, being reported. So uh, from the PNP uh, records, uh, uh, most of violence against women are physical, uh, but you see uh, sexual uh, violence as well. Uh, so you have physical, sexual, and both physical and sexual as reported. Um, the DSWD serves women and their children. And so there are also reports from the administrative records of, of DSWD on uh, victims of trafficking, uh, prostitution, emotionally involved, abused women, as well as children experiencing such. And women empowerment is part of the National uh, Demographic and Health Survey, which where women respondents are asked questions uh, that I mentioned about uh, Juana Filipina. And so uh, women have their own mobile phones. Sometimes we in the Philippines, we just, you know, uh, we brush this aside because there is freedom for us, but looking at statistics in other countries, these are not so in some countries of the world. Uh, women don't have such uh, freedom. Uh, but even if uh, we have freedom to have our own house, our own land, have a bank account, 
we can see here that women in the uh, survey, uh, only 22% of them reported that they have their own bank account. Uh, from my experience, uh, many of these re many of these uh, is because of lack of government issued ID or uh, lack of birth certificate. And so the national ID is really one way of addressing uh, our countrymen who cannot get bank accounts because they still are in the process of correcting their birth certificates or uh, doing late registration. Ladies uh, and gentlemen, friends, uh, this ends my data story, Juana Filipina. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that. A very interesting talk. And I'm sure our audience have a lot of questions. And um, yeah, there are a few questions already on the chat box. So for the others, you can also type in your questions or you can do a raise hand so that I can call on you if you want to address your question directly to our speaker. So the first one comes from Tito Aliga. It looks like Juana is here, but her mind is to be abroad. Does this mean that she would like to go away from all the domestic issues? Regarding the names, we as parents of the 60s and 70s referred first to the calendar showing saints in this. Maybe you can comment on that. Yes, Tito. Actually, uh, the usual reason, uh, well, Juana, Juana wants to be an OFW. And the usual reason is she wants to help her family. Uh, that, that's that's the typical reason for our women leaving uh, for work abroad to be labor migrants. And uh, well, you dated yourself, Tito, saying <laughs> that <laughs> that your the uh, uh, names come from the calendar. <laughs> yes, yes, you do. <laughs> so times have changed. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, Dr. Likwanan, would you like to ask a question? Thank you so much, Lisa. I, I like the idea of, uh, you know, the, 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 the visuals and present data in a more interesting way. There were just a number of things that struck me. I had always thought that uh, there were more again this might date me but there are more mm. females than males are you saying now that statistically there are more males than females that's a change isn't it uh-huh and, yes, and maybe, what, what, yeah, yes can you explain that yes ma'am actually this is from the 2015 census of the population so 51% males 49% females why is that? Does it mean that the, because before they would, part of the explanation was women live longer, etc. So what, what could that change be the result of? Well, my guess is that it's really just statistical. Uh, uh, actually, it's, uh, it's usually 50-50, right? Uh, That's right. Giving birth. But uh, uh, I don't really know the reason why it's, it has moved to 5149. Right. I don't know what it is now for the 2020 uh, census. But uh, for me, it's really more the, the, uh, the, the uh, probability really swings. Uh, okay. The 50-50 the could swing upwards or downwards. Uh, so maybe that's 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 the, the reason that, that that wasn't really my main question because uh, <laughs> I, but it, I was just struck by it but perhaps my comment would come by form of a request I really like the idea of using statistics this way there are three portraits or pictures of Juana that I think I would appreciate more of you mentioned them one is uh, of course the violence against poor Juana and the prevalence and the types, I think we would need a better picture of that because we are not always aware of it. We seem to think that Filipinas have it very good, but that is one problem, the violence. But the other thing I, I also would like a better picture of 
would be Juana's um, unpaid work, all the work she does, which is not, which is not recorded, which is not paid, and uh, almost invisible. So that would be the second area. The third area I would also want a better picture of would be Juana's political participation. Because the fact is, I, I think even your data showed that, that slightly more women vote than, than men, slightly more. But in terms of being in, in public office, running for office, and, and certainly a woman's vote, that's so far away. And so I would be very interested in that kind of picture of Juana, her political participation, because I would want more of it, for instance. Just your thoughts. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, actually, the data stories about Juana is not yet complete. So I will have to update it, the, the stories and add more. And thank you so much for your suggestion. As regards unpaid work, the good news is that uh, the Philippine Statistics Authority has actually piloted uh, uh, data collection on unpaid work. And uh, I, I just don't know where the future goes, but uh, that is one uh, plan of the PSA, as I know, that uh, they would want to look into because this is, this is part of our commitment with the I, uh, International Labor Organization where we will have to have more statistics on decent work. And uh, so unpaid work is a big part, as I've shown, of uh, women's participation in the labor force. So I will look for the statistics, ma'am. Uh, I think they are available already. On political participation, I missed that. Um, but but oh, we could you? Know. <laughs> yes. In this season. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, uh, actually, we are still lagging behind uh, this particular SDG indicator of uh, uh, political participation of women, specifically of women members in the parliament. We are still really uh, not where we want to be. Uh, I, I still need to check about the latest uh, 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 sex disaggregated data on uh, registration in the COMELEC. And that will be an important uh, input into the story of uh, Juana. Um, it, just some thoughts, however, uh, I, I see from my uh, experience that in the Philippines, higher positions are still occupied by men. But I talk about what I call the middles. The middles, which are very important. These are the middle management. I see that even in UP, most of the deals are females. In government service, a number of the middle managers are actually yeah, females. That's true. That's true. Uh, but I don't have the statistics. So these are just like uh, my, my own sense. And that is something that uh, maybe we should also emphasize. Because in my mind, middle management are very important to the top management. Kumbaga, the middle, our middle makes us sexy. <laughs> so the middles are important. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your... Thank you. Call. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, the next question comes from uh, Felina Lansigan. Do we have data or official statistics showing how much of the gender and development budget is actually used by LGUs to empower women? This will reflect the prioritization of it by LGUs. Hi, no, it's always good to hear your questions and comments. The data are there, I just don't have them. But also again, uh, from my experience, uh, uh, the, the GAD, the GAD, uh, budget is not really uh, achieved by all government agencies. Uh, uh, and if the budget really goes to uh, projects that would benefit women, 
uh, we actually have uh, good data because all government agencies, including LGUs, report on their GAD activities. Um, I just didn't have the time to, to look at them. Yeah, but the data are there. Thank you, No. Okay, thank you. So the next question is from Dr. Rodora Buko, and she's raising her hand. Maybe you can unmute yourself um, so that uh, you can address your question directly to our speaker. Okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, yeah, we can hear you now. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Good morning, Dr. Lisa. I was able to have all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the alert. Uh, congratulations for the very creative presentation of the Estado of Juana. But my concern is in your description of the empowered Juana. Uh, like Tati, I feel that there is a need to fill in the data on the political disempowerment of women. That's the reason why we slid, slide to number 17 in the global gender gap ranking. Right. Yeah. Because there are very few women now in the highest decision-making bodies of our country. Uh, the other, uh, regarding the unpaid care work, during your time, we really look forward to uh, PSA coming up with a national time use study of women. Although as of now, Oxfam and the UP Center for Women Studies have lately conducted a national study on unpaid care work. So that would might be very relevant data in your uh, Stado Niwana when it comes to unpaid care work. Still, women primarily performs the unpaid care work in the reproductive uh, work, even if uh, men do share uh, domestic work. And also with regard to political def definition of yours on uh, empowerment, I think there is a need to add data on how many women own Torrance title, land transfer certificates, how many women have access to resources and other entitlements. Those might be very uh, robust data that would really show us the, the other remaining gaps with, with regard the empowerment of Juana. And um, because in terms of political opportunities, as you have said, women's uh, very low participation in the labor force is an indication. And maybe in the future, you could expand your story about the marginalized women from among the marginalized sectors defined in the Magna Carta of women, urban poor women, rural women, peasant women, migrant women, indigenous women, Moro women, uh, elderly women and PWD women. So thank you very much, Lisa. More creative work on the stand of Buana. Making thank statistics taste, tasteful and delicious to people who are afraid of numbers. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Rod. And taking notes of all your suggestions because they make uh, better data stories. Uh, actually, I. I'm doing some uh, study on um, international migration and there are really interesting results there about um, uh, labor migrants, women in particular. So yes, more, more, more substance to Juana's uh, data stories. Thank you so much. Thank you. Before I go to Dr. Aura Matias, I'll just read the question from Vicente Hurlano. So thank you for a very informative presentation. Juana's story is indeed very relevant and needs to be shared. Sharing the story via data makes for a more compelling story. What's your take about the increasing trend on using big data analytics as another platform in sharing stories? So thank you again. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I'm an advocate, actually, of uh, uh, what, what we call the data ecosystem, where uh, one should mine uh, various sources of information. Um, and, and so what I mined for my data story about Juana uh, are from official statistics, which are uh, mainly surveys, censuses, and some administrative data. Big data is a rich source of uh, adding to uh, Juana's uh, data story. Uh, uh, in my mind, though, 
there, we should still continue to discuss standards uh, of uh, uh, that, what, that we need to use for big data uh, to uh, ensure issues of uh, bias, uh, you know, uh, making sure that uh, the, the data story will indeed be a typical one. So yes, yes, to, to big data. Thank you. Now I'd like to call Dr. Matias. Hi, Aura. Good morning, Ma'am Lisa. I'm very, very pleased to be here. And I, I'm natutuwa ako sa mga datos at saka the images that you are, you are sharing with us. Um, ang, I'd like to uh, ask, uh, if, have you observed you know, the changing roles and the, the, the difference now in the stereotype? the different roles that women now take. Kasi like, for example, I've observed that more of our, um, more of our women um, uh, get married at a later age. So they're not, you know, they're not, uh, they're not in a hurry to, to get married. Uh, they have different priorities these days. Uh, of course, I appreciate the comments of Imam Tati and uh, uh, Dr. Bukoy about you know the changing participation and influencing influence women as influencers in the various sectors. But uh, I also want to know because I've transitioned from being a traditional um, working mom to now a solo parent. So do we have statistics on that role of women? Because uh, I've all. I'm now encountering a lot of solo parents and the, the differences in, in the roles that they take uh, uh, in, in, in this time and in, in, during this time. So uh, just, those, <laughs> just those thoughts uh, at the moment. Thank you, Aura. Actually, uh, yes, uh, we see changing, there's a, there's a changing trend uh, in, the, in, in women's uh, roles. Uh, however, I think you, your exposure is with your cohort. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the result of the census of 2015, uh, age of marriage of women is still around 23 years old. Yeah. But if we look at a certain group you will see, change. of course, there's always variability if you look at different clusters. And I find that uh, middle class uh, educated women uh, or middle class families would be typically uh, outside of that uh, general picture. So uh, 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 it would be interesting to indeed do, do some disaggregation of the data to, to find more uh, uh, nuances. Uh, no one says that you mentioned the the surveys also the way we capture demographics has been changing um, before civil status is simply single uh, single never married, uh, married. Uh, widowed uh, uh, separated there are now changes in the way we capture or we classify such so we now accept uh, partners. Uh, uh, so married uh, need not be with a legal document, a marriage certificate. And in fact, in, in the Philippines, we haven't really changed as much as the developed countries because in developed countries, they now report solo parents. Yeah. Uh, in the Philippines, we do not yet do that. Uh, so, uh, uh, if I may have like a side story, in the 1903 <clears throat> census, 1903, yeah, uh, the classifications of the of, of Filipinos were there were classifications like uh, uh, defective and non-defective. Uh, the defectives are and the blind. The ones we now refer to as persons, uh, uh, well, uh, with disability. Uh, uh, we also had classifications before of civilized and uncivilized. 
Uh, so that was 1903. In this era we're in, we will see more changes in classif classifying our population using your, your own story, Al. Mm -hmm. So the, the data are there. They just have to be, again, mined and, uh, and uh, looked into more closely. Mm -hmm. Pero yung marriage, in general, ganun pa rin ako, 23 to 24 years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, kasi ang, uh, what I'm seeing also is like, you know, uh, the picture that we, we, we send in our schools, you know, the role of si nanay, ganito ang trabaho, si tatay. Yeah. Oh yeah, iba na. So, so dapat, uh -oh. so, sort of, you know, th there must be some, uh, some way of, you know, opening up uh, to more flexible range of, you know, uh, images of a woman and a women's roles and women's roles. So right. um, there's still a lot to do as far as even, you know, changing the way that we, we uh, present uh, uh, the roles of the family members you know, in, in, our, in our schools. Yes, and th that's, that's the, uh, no, uh, that's the uh, relevance of the comment of Dr. Bukoy earlier about uh, time use survey. Uh, because uh, time use survey would really uh, monitor uh, the, the time spent by women and men uh, in a typical day. Uh, that will reveal. Uh, but I'd like, like to get, tell you my story as well. When my daughter was asked by her teacher in elementary to draw the household, uh, the, her drawing was Sinanay si Tatay, pareho ang pumuputa sa office. Tapos si Yaya, siya yung gumagawa na chabaw sa bahay. <laughs> so, but this is, the, this is what, what I call our own grouping. It may be different in in other women groups. Thank, thank you, you, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for that. Um, yeah, so before I recall Dr. Perny, I'd like to acknowledge first uh, the presence of so many celebrities. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, everyone is here. So Farmer Ched Chair, Dr. Dequanan, former UP President. Dr. Pascual, my boss former, before. Yeah, UP Dean. <laughs> and uh, my other Dr. boss, Dr. Pernia. Pernia. Yes, Dr. Pernia is also here. <laughs> uh, National Scientist Ramirez, um, Paase Bo BOD Board of Directors, Officers and Members, former Secretary Yusek Guevara, Friends of EO. RDFI, Tito Aliga, Chato Calderon, and everyone else. So st all star cast yung ating, uh, <laughs> ating I would like to, audience. Okay, I would like to mention or, also Professor Sita Albazea, who, who is yes, a colleague yes. in statistics in UP Los Banos, formerly uh, director of the Philippine Statistical Research Training Institute. Okay, let me just read a comment from Tito Aliga. It seems like the items that measure empowerment do not address the main problem cited. So that should lead us to focus on solutions and really act on them. Okay, now I'd like to call Dr. Pernia. He's raising his hand. Dr. Pernia. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. And good morning to Lisa. Good morning, sir. Favorite undersecretary. Oh, don't tell that to, uh, to the others. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, Lisa, uh, would you have data by quintile, uh, women by quintiles, from the poorest to the richest uh, quintiles? And uh, because that would, I, I'd like to know what is the, you know, because we, we always say that women uh, have really high, high ranking positions in, no, we, we just say that in general, but then if you, we divide women by quintile, uh, wealth quintile or income quintile, then it would vary considerably. Meaning the, those in the upper quintiles, maybe the uh, topmost and the second, uh, second topmost quintile would have uh, women really, uh, you know, having very high positions in government, in, uh, in the corporations. But if you go down the lower quintiles, women would be, you know, I am most of the women they would be, uh, you know, being left behind, uh, very very low positions, and maybe not even having, uh, not even participating in the labor force, and that explains why labor force participation of women are low, and I think it's uh, the lowest among ASEAN countries, 
and that is because they have more children too, right? And if you if, if you go by the uh, total fertility rate among uh, again by quintile women, the the bottom quintile would have uh, 4.3 as of uh, the present. No, oh, uh, well, this is uh, I'm sorry, this is the latest data are 2017. 4.3 for the bottom quintile for the uh, richest quintile of women, uh, 1.7 lang ang total f- fertility rate. Meaning uh, these, are, these are the number of children that are born by women over, the, 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 over the, their uh, reproductive years. No? So that, that, is the, that is the thing there. Uh, we, our, and in fact, the other way of looking at it also is we can, do, we can look at the uh, classes, A, B, C, D, E. We know that the, I think the D are the very, are the heaviest in terms of uh, part, in terms of uh, participants in the uh, in the in that uh, classification. So I think that 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 kind of uh, information would be useful so that we can tell we cannot just generalize that women are are having uh, you know high positions in government in uh, in the corp- in the corporate world and and so on. Do we have those? Data? I'm sure you have. You are the you are the guardian of uh, Philippine statistics. Sir, we have the data. Uh, thank you very much. And your comment is actually relevant to the comment of uh, Dr. Matias earlier, Aura, about uh, her her you know her understanding of the situation of women. It's really because the the uh, the experiences of women actually are so different if you look at them by uh, income quintiles. Uh, so I will add that to my data story, uh, sir. Uh, th- there's another interesting statistic that came out actually uh, that I forgot to share here. This was when we looked at uh, uh, the uh, households by quintile. We found that uh, the poorest and the richest households are actually female-headed households. So if a household is female-headed, it will either be among the richest or it will be among the poorest. That's that's actually a very interesting result that I saw that I will uh, uh, include in my data story of uh, the next version. Thank you for that. So let me just go to a comment by um, Tito Aliga. So regarding women in, in government, it might be good to see how many governors and mayors are women. So his guess is about maybe 20 to 25 percent, meaning that they do have power to direct um, solutions. And before I move to um, Chato Calderon, I'll just read a comment from Chona Abelardo. Um, so thank you so much for this comprehensive report on who Juana is in the 21st century. This information shows how different our lives can be to the majority of the Juanas in the Philippines. So she works with communities and coastal um, regions, and it is very common to see hesitation in changing status quo. And any sign of empowerment can be viewed as something to keep women happy enough to let them feel some form of independence when ownership of property is viewed as a gift but the women who own them don't necessarily get to decide what happens to the property themselves but not true self-actualization as they still have limited access to job opportunities or defining a future for themselves away from being approved or supported by a husband or a family member how much do the numbers we get uh, reflect these types of cultural subtleties. Thank you, Kay. Uh, So what I gave is a, what I call the average Filipina, the typical Filipina. So the comment is again, similar to the comment of Dr. Pernia, where we need to do some disaggregations, looking at situations now by certain groups. And uh, definitely women in the lower uh, uh, socioeconomic classes would be really uh, uh, this more disadvantaged uh, with some cultural uh, or, uh, uh, behavior in the communities and in their families limiting women. Uh, so there is much to do actually uh, uh, to create a whole uh, book 
of data stories of women. So maybe in my next version, I will not just be talking about Juana, but I may, I may also talk about uh, uh, maybe uh, Joanne. <laughs> maybe it will be a series other. of books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, different women uh, in the stories. Great. Um, I'll call Chato Calderon to give... Um, Hi, Chato. Good to see you again. I'm calling you from San Francisco. Right. And I'm so happy to join you. Um, here in the U.S., I'm a, I'm a volunteer of the Small Business Administration um, nonprofit affiliate, which is called SCORE. And our purpose is to mentor small businesses because we feel that small business, businesses in, in America and anywhere is the lifeblood of any economy. And what, what we're seeing is that women are more entrepreneurial because they're, they're the ones uh, seeking to, uh, for financial or, or mentoring assistance. And in fact, 60% of our clients last year were women. Would you believe that the SCORE, the Small Business Administration SCORE, created over 45,000 new jobs, new, not new jobs, new businesses in spite of the COVID. So there is opportunity in creating uh, businesses. My question is, uh, do you have any data on women entrepreneurs in the Philippines? Because I feel that um, as a woman and knowing other women, we tend to be more entrepreneurial and creative. Do we have any uh, data on that? And how can we empower women to be more entrepreneurial? Thank you very much, Chato. We have such data. Uh, as I've said, uh, official statistics is very rich in information. So we have actually uh, such information in the labor force survey, as well as in the family income and expenditure survey. So you gave me an idea as well on, on another future area of research or uh, yeah, study. Uh, this is about women entrepreneur. And uh, I also have some information about uh, women entrepreneurs here in the Philippines. And uh, yes, also here in the Philippines, it seems that women in the micro, uh, microfinancing, microfinancing, yes. uh, they, have a, they have like a credit scoring and women tend to uh, have higher score. Uh, uh, women who seek for loans or uh, grants for microfinance have higher score because typically they're able to make the business, their small business grow and manage uh, their uh, finances well uh, compared to the, to the men. So I guess that uh, what you see in the United States seem to be the same here uh, uh, in the Philippines. And I know that some community development practitioners, they actually also really talk to women when it comes to uh, additional extra income for the family uh, with this uh, micro industries. Uh, I'm, I'm writing down uh, that, uh, that particular note you have, Chato. That information is there. I just don't, didn't include it in my data story. Great. Maybe what we could do next is have a partnership with like the Rotary Club or Chamber of Commerce or other um, social uh, uh, entrepreneur organizations to help women in building their financial literacy or things that they need to, to, to boost the women as entrepreneurs. It's just a suggestion because we're doing that here. Well, we, there will be more conversations on this, especially with Giselle. Uh, Giselle, actually with yeah. Zorano, Giselle actually is with Zonta. And this, yeah, this presentation I made uh, actually was first to the Zonta uh, women. Uh, because of their advocacies as well, uh, the same advocacies that you mentioned. So Good maybe idea. Chato can join us in Zonta. Okay. And, uh, I also invited uh, Chair Patricia Likwanan to speak in Zonta, and uh, then Lisa. Anyway, I'll I can tell you a bit about it later. But I think, hey, I think uh, President Pasquale's hand is raised. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. I'm calling him next. <laughs> yes, President Pasquale. Kindly unmute and. Hi, Lisa. Thanks Hi, sir. For, uh, Belated happy uh, birthday. Uh. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> well, my exposure after UP has been in the back to the corporate world, you know. And as you may know, there are very strong movements to 
raise the participation of women, uh, not just in the middle, which you find uh, where sexiness is, but more at the upper levels, you know. Uh, we have done, we have commissioned, when I was uh, president of the Institute uh, for Corporate uh, Directors, we commissioned the uh, Ateneo de Manila University to do a study for us uh, on uh, the, what's constraining women from moving up to the level of the board, being uh, board directors. And it started by looking at the various layers that we've been talking about earlier. You know, women would normally start to be in the majority. Like uh, women, there are more women college graduates than male college graduates. And then when they start working, uh, the, the proportion becomes 50-50. Okay, so there is a reduction of women uh, in uh, the middle or operational level. And then the managerial level, uh, the, the proportion of women drops to 22%. And then at the board level, it's even lower at 15%. So there is what uh, we term a supply funnel. There's a funneling effect, the supply funnel to the board level, because that's our concern, you know, at the Institute of Corporate Directors. Uh, we want more women on board because because we believe that uh, women have the characteristics, typical female characteristics that uh, will work best in terms of uh, performing the stewardship function of the board. What we found out is that there are uh, constraints. What, what's pulling down women? Uh, why are they not climbing up the ladder fully up to the top? We found out that uh, there are at least uh, two typical burdens, the burden of childbearing and the burden of uh, homemaking or taking care of the home. Uh, that's the reason why among the college graduates, after they get married and start bearing children, they drop off, you know? So there's less women going into uh, uh, corporate work. And then at the managerial level, uh, they're so tied down to make, taking care of children, taking care of the home, that they're not able to compete fully at the managerial level. And at the board level, we found a third constraint, you know, and the third constraint is that the ambition, ambition, uh, the ambition, interest of uh, women uh, wanes. Ma many who are qualified to be board members, they seem to uh, drop, drop off and don't aspire. So I, 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 this was not done as an extensive survey. And I hope you know, that we could have more reliable statistics uh, because we certainly would like seeing more women on board. Uh, our target is 50-50, you know, 50%, but the supply constraint is there. So we have to work on the on the supply, uh, and uh, there are, and we found out that the best way to do it to do this is in movements where women help women, because women who have already achieved uh, the right levels in the organization are in the best position to mentor those coming up, and they can also mentor them not only in terms of. Uh, what they need to know to be good managers or to be good uh, board directors, but also how to balance, you know, life and work, uh, because that's normally where the failure is. But I, these are just uh, uh, observations. So I guess there is a need to do a more intensive study, extensive study, on this matter, and data will certainly help. Thank you, sir. Sir, thank you so much. You know, listening to you and the other comments earlier, I, I would like to uh, seek to, to give recommendation to Giselle and Paase. Uh, I believe that you have some webinars with which uh, were in the engagement of the participants and the resource persons becomes really interesting and intense. I find that this is one of them. Uh, maybe. 
there should be like a something that will come out of this. I don't know, like Chato said, some partnerships <laughs> offline. Uh, but but yes, sir. Actually, I also had this study for um for the uh, TESDA training center, uh, the training the the uh, training women's center of TESDA, which was supported by JICA before. And we did a study of the women graduates of their tech book courses. And we found the same uh, 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 result as what you did with your high level women, where after the women graduate from the, the, uh, the tech book courses, they are armed with more skills and they actually are able to be employed. However, when they become married and they have children, that's where they stop working. So the solution for such women by the uh, 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 test the Training Women's Center is to include in their courses entrepreneurial. So tamang tama yung sinabi ni Chato, where uh, women uh, should be encouraged to go become entrepreneurs because maybe that's where they can do a good balance uh, of, of uh, being uh, uh, mothers, uh, wives, at, at the same time uh, being part of the labor force. But this is that group of women. These are the women who uh, are graduates of technical vocational courses. So Panam, what I'm seeing is that this, this conversations now happening are for me converging into something bigger than just having a story, story about Mana Filipina. Uh, I'm, I'm taking a lot of notes, uh, Giselle. By the way, Lisa, may I just add quickly? Yes, sir. Uh, I talk about childbearing, taking care of the home. But with, when women get older, at the time when they're already, uh, in fact, well qualified to assume board directorships, uh, some we found out that some would rather take care or play with their apos, you know, with their grandchildren. So the, the grandmother role comes into play. That's me. Uh, and it becomes a deterrent, you know, to further engagement of women in uh, in corporate work. Sir, sir I, I will but give you a scanty data, you know. Sir, I will give you a different perspective. Yep. They leave the board room. But they go to the future generation. That's right. Yeah, they yeah. They help shape the future generation. <laughs> <laughs> different role. Different, different role. role. Yes, Giselle. <laughs> Giselle became perked up when you mentioned Apo. Seven. Seven already. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank well, you for that. I have. I have, uh, I have nine grandchildren. Uh, soon oh. I will have more than you. I, I let my wife <laughs> take care of. I mean. You see, I will them. have more yeah, apos than you. <laughs> uh, is this a competition now of number of apos? <laughs> yeah, breeding the next generation. <laughs> it is a challenge of nature versus na nurture. <laughs> Pursuing your nature, your um, you know, your ambitions, and uh, you know, honing your talents versus taking care of the next generation nurturing yeah. them so it's a very very uh, challenging situation for women we know it yes yes okay okay yes. Uh, let me just read uh, a few more comments and questions from the chat and then hopefully we can end by 9 30. the next one comes from zita albasea which is in a way segues uh, well related to what you just mentioned uh, dr lisa no? so uh, it's um it's inspiring to find innovative ways of presenting statistics so she's curious about women participation in science and technology do we actually have data on this Yes, we have data, and again, as uh, as I said, uh, I failed to really go into the disaggregations. Uh, uh, but you know, the data show there are not many women um, in science and technology. Okay, thank you. And then the next two comments come from uh, Al Serafika. So, on family planning, how much of an impact was the RH bill in public assistance? Did we compare the data before and after the bill? Uh, say on the use of contraception was implemented. Hi, all. Unfortunately, I didn't go to such analytics, but but uh, 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 Dr. Pernia is here. I don't. I think he. 
Part, yeah, part of the question is for Dr. Pernia, actually, and my father-in-law. Oh, yes. Uh, he did present, he did present at the uh, Senate on RH bill. But uh, I'm very yeah, encouraged by your 2017 data that uh, it is more than half already in utilization and much of it is coming from public. Yes. And clearly, um, I'm, I'm right. seeing the, the family rate at 2.7 now and seeing the, the 1.7 increase in our population. It, there's hope that we're not going to get uh, swamped by more children but of course the growth stunting is a completely different question oh yeah that's Maybe. another concern <laughs> but you know al i go back to disaggregating the data by uh, uh socioeconomic classes unfortunately the improvements that we see in general come from the middle class mm -hmm. the 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 lower classes are still really mm, yeah it's the, they are still a challenge and for me you know as a taxpayer and as a grandparent, I'm worried about the future of my grandchildren. If they continue to become middle class, they will, you know, be the taxpayers and they will really uh, uh, bear the burden of the demographics that we are still. But that's, that's the way it is. I mean, even in the United States, where I spent 25 years of my life, oh, it's always okay. the middle class that, that actually right. pay for all the social services. Right. I just like it that there's no super poor back in there in the, in the first world countries. Right. We really have to take care of our poor people and being able to get education definitely and, and feeding programs that we've discussed here in Paase are some of the real ills. So poverty is our biggest enemy uh, yeah. more than anything else. And uh, it affects both male and female, but I think the burden is more on the male. I just wanted to plug in with Chato. Chato. The uh, Center for Agricultural Rural Development, headed by Dr. Alit, was an awardee of the uh, Ramon del Rosario Awards uh, way back in 2018. He lends over 10 billion, I think, a year, and he opens his talk every time. I only lend to women. 99% or 100% of our loan and the nanas are always the one. And I know Giselle invited one in one of our events uh, who manages a uh, a similar support group for Nana is 85,000. Mm -hmm. I just sketched my, my name of uh, that person, Giselle. Uh, mercy uh, but, Abad. But definitely, uh, Chato, we're, we're more than happy to see how we can interrelate indeed, increasing the uh, the ecosystem of women entrepreneurs. Because in UP, I do a university in, uh, innovation fellows as well as programs that we started when President Pascual and Giselle were still in, in the administration on uh, uh, techno. Uh, uh, commercialization, and I tell you, more than half are women in terms of the technologies that wants businesses to be put out for. And right now, I'm mentoring four. Only one is a guy. Four are women. So I think Chato would be more than happy to work with you and Tito from the Earth Fee Group uh, to uh, to see if you really want to explore the women aspect. I've been promoting a small business innovative research grant together with uh, uh, Secretary Pernia and. Finally, it's getting traction with the two new laws on Innovation Act and startup grants. So I think it's a good time, hoping that we can, uh, as, as Tito would say, turbocharge it in the next administration. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> so Bernie, yeah, did you? I'm sorry, who was uh, Dr. Chato? Yeah, kindly. No, if we could uh, follow up later, uh, off, yeah. offline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be great. Great. Thank um, you. Yeah, let, let me let me uh, say something about Al's uh, uh, intervention. Well, definitely, poverty really is our uh, primordial problem. We are among the poorest. I think the poorest among yeah in uh, in ASEAN. Uh, no, no, but... Also, in terms of uh, population growth, I mean uh, total fertility. We are we are also the highest, and uh, it has taken the uh, RH to gain traction. It was uh, passed in Congress in 2012, but it was not until you know uh, President Duterte came in, who is an advocate, a passionate advocate of family planning, that uh, it was uh, you know it was uh, it was pushed, and uh, it is uh, it is already you know uh, a priority. But then you know uh, there are so many he has so many other priorities, and he seems to be confused what to do. So it's not really. It's not really moving as fast as, as it should, and uh, you know if we had uh, if, if we had done the way Thailand did sustained family planning, we should only be about seventy million now instead of one hundred and nine mil 
million population. So, so, so big a difference. Poverty incidence would have been only 8% as in, as in Thailand. Our poverty incidence is, well, we brought it down to 16.7% in 2018, but it's now back up to, to, on the, to the 20s. So it's, it's a terrible situation. We really have uh, so many missed opportunities. And this thing about population is really one of the biggest missed opportunities uh, that we have uh, uh, committed. And uh, we, are, we are now bearing the consequences. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. And it was a very good um, um, yeah, discussion. Just want to add uh, what Dr. Likwanen put in the chat that um, entrepreneurship is great, but it's not really the solution. What we should also set up would be better support services for working women. And also men should finally share with home and care responsibilities. <laughs> All right. So thank you. Now, um, yeah, I'd like to call Dr. Concepcion, Giselle. Uh, you, you're still on mute, uh, Giselle. Yeah, we can't hear you. Thanks, Kay and Lisa, okay. uh, for all the um, uh, well uh, dynamism that we've had in this uh, 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 presentation. And I'd like to thank the alpha males in the audience, so many of them who are championing uh, the cause of women. So uh, many times it's because, um, you know, you have alpha males who are always competing and suppressing uh, the alpha females who are also here in this uh, uh, chat. So um, like uh, uh, Sec Ernie always says, we must uh, practice virtuous impatience. And one way of putting it in passe for me is, I am so tired of paralysis analysis, to be honest, okay? So we keep on analyzing, we keep on presenting uh, the problem, but we offer no solutions. And that seems to be the case in many of the conferences attended by hundreds and thousands, and there's no next step forward. But the alpha males in Paase, like Al Sarafika, or uh, you know, Tito Aliga, uh, friends of Paase, or President Pasqua, you know, we want to uh, get things done. And so I think it's fitting for me to talk about Ashi. So Al, that group is Ahon Sahira Foundation, its president is Mercy Abad, the wife of Jimmy Abad, our university professor in UP. And um, Mercy Abad provides us the opportunity, Lisa, to make a difference um, among 97,000 women. And on behalf of um, Dr. Rabukoy, who's with us, Zonta, I'd like to uh, share my advocacy in Zonta. So I have not been active there, but I said I would be uh, if I'm able to make a real difference. And so I invited Dr. Liquanan, Dr. Lisa Bersales, Dr. De, de Ungria, uh, head of the DNA lab in UP uh, uh, Diliman and also with the Philippine Genome Center uh, to try to help solve the problems of the marginalized women, okay? And um, there's a need for this as um, shared with us by Mercy Abad. From her own experience, uh, there is this uh, prevalence of um, teenage pregnancy or a uh, lack of self-worth of the women and their um, female children that we are trying to address with Cora de Ungria and the uh, Child Protection Unit in PGH, two MDs we've been meeting to try to make um, representations with the PNP and with the mayors on um, DNA testing, because many of these teenage pregnancies are actually the result of violence, okay? So that's ongoing. That's how we're moving things forward. How is PASE uh, working with Ashi and also with a group of Father Ben, who's ad addressing um, uh, poverty, hunger, and malnutrition among school children, okay? Where uh, he has uh, had a school feeding program that is run by nanas by their mothers, okay? We are trying to uh, provide the women financial literacy. So Lisa, you'd be happy to know that we uh, linked with uh, Phoenix. So we linked with um, Manchu Serena and uh, the Phoenix group, and we have actually provided financial literacy um, lectures to the 
nanais of uh, Mercy Abad. And the way uh, they're uh, organized is this. And this um, kind of affirms what I'll mention, that women work together. So uh, Mercy has a group, the women into like five, and they help one another. And there's always a leader in the group. And sometimes uh, they're lent money because it's a microfinancing uh, operation. Okay, a very successful one, Lisa, because their total loan from the land bank is 1 billion pesos. They have a credit line of 1 billion and they're able to pay 95% before COVID. And then it dropped about 85% uh, during COVID. But now it's, uh, you know, resuming again. And uh, they have created value chains um, for uh, the microfinancing of uh, women's um, businesses. Many of them are agricultural, okay? But some of them are like just sari sari stores, okay? So anyway, there are metrics, Lisa, on the success of the program of ASHI. So I would like to uh, suggest that perhaps we could move forward by trying to uh, focus on data that we could get um, from the ASHI women, okay, whom uh, Mercy is in charge of overall. Okay, one final thing with Edna Ko, our other member and former, uh, you know, team of APAEP, we are trying to find a way to get the women uh, to be empowered to vote the right candidate. And this is an appeal from Mercy Abad, okay? And um, well, we already know that there is now a, a move to get 7 million uh, Filipinos registered. Those who are not registered to be registered. But Mercy Abad would like us to develop materials that the women, the nanais could understand um, on, on how to, vote the right candidate. You can imagine the ripple effect of uh, reaching out to 97,000 nanais, uh, mostly in, the, in Luzon and the Visayas, and uh, I think none yet in Mindanao, okay? So uh, we're trying to address uh, these problems of the marginalized women, not so much um, the, um, you know, the, the middle or the high level entrepreneurs, but the um, microfinancing uh, scheme of the ASHI makes entrepreneurs of these women, Chato, in case you're interested. And I always say, what is the impact of education? Because they're actually supporting the education of their children. So much so much so that, you know, in the next generation or in the next few years, uh, the uh, kind of livelihood that they would have or the kind of enterprise they would be engaged in would be um, higher value. Okay, so I think, uh, we can't solve the problems of the country, but uh, in Pasa, we're trying to um, solve on the ground problems in um, specific places in the regions in line with what uh, the DOST wants us to do, science for the people, science in the regions. And we're really embracing that because we believe in it. So um, offline, we're gonna, or after this uh, meeting, we're gonna have uh, you know some of us really interested to get involved in things that um, you know we we think could make a difference in the lives of our women, and I'd like to thank uh, Chair Tati because uh, during her time uh, as a chair of uh, Chad and of the UP board, we were very conscious of um, implementing the Magna Carta of women. Lisa, remember that that you were always uh, watching the the God right because she's always telling you to uh, to do that. Okay, so I think it's um, uh, important that um, um, while the women are not yet uh, the leaders in R&D in terms of publication or inventions, but the women are actually in academe. I think you have that data, Lisa, that there are also more women uh, who are teaching in uh, the primary and secondary levels as well as in the tertiary level. And that was my question in the, in the chat box. And it's partly uh, financial. It's partly uh, because uh, the men would not like to stay so much in academe because the pay is not as good as uh, pay in uh, the private sector, okay? Mm -hmm. So women uh, who uh, have had their children uh, then would like to uh, then work, uh, find it to be a good profession. Anyway, I mean, it's a very complex problem, but I think there are ways to um, 
you know, address it at a high level so that the impact would be felt uh, greatly and effectively, um, you know, through the regions. I'll just tell you one thing that uh, Zonta did for ASHI. Mercy asked for 65 tablets, tablets, just so we could communicate with the top 65 ASHI women. So we raised the money for that. And so we held our financial literacy course. We can do other courses now or uh, little uh, meetings with Edna Ko on how to uh, guide our women to uh, vote properly. And you know how we're thinking of doing it, Lisa, everyone? Edna's idea is uh, to interview some uh, youth, some young people, good ones, to share with us, with the women, their dreams and aspirations for the future. Okay, the other idea which I have, and I know that um, Lisa and Edna and others know that I've been at this for some time, and it will it will be good for uh, Dr. Bukoy to um, you know join me in this is to hear the stories of OFWs, OFWs who know how things work abroad, in different work sectors, health, engineering, services, etc. In other countries, the Filipinos uh, work well and they know that the system works. So if you have some key OFWs uh, giving talks, say to our nanais or to any group that we're, we're trying to empower uh, to vote properly, then maybe uh, they can think of who the candidates are who might provide the same kind of a, you know, government governance where things work and things progress. Okay, anyway, so, you know, I wish that we could really get more like-minded people together to work together and, you know, on the ground, hindi lang yung discuss ng discuss, analyze ng analyze, analyze uh, uh, you know, project ng project ng mga, mga mangyayari o hindi mangyayari. I think at some point we have, we have to come up with our implementable actions. So, okay? so you, you're, you're calling for action, Giselle. It's of a call course, to action. Always, <laughs> always, you, always, you end always with... we're always calling for action. Yes. Diba yun naman yung trademark ng uh, ano, yung uh, administration ni President Pascual. We were always into uh, pursuing um, uh, the actions, no? Based I think Dr. The... Bukoy would like to say something. Yes, Dr. Yeah, Bukoy, then... please. Yeah, and then we can... Very we can frustrating through. talaga, yeah. no? Thank you very much, Dr. Giselle. You were my vice president when I was uh, chair of the UP Social Sciences Division. Yes. And I'm very much uh, inspired by what you're doing through Zonda in Manila. Uh, I I'm an invited honorary member of Zonda Club to Cebu, and we're doing a lot of advocacy to advance uh, the protection of women with regards to violence and making uh, Cebu a safe space for women. And yes, uh, we really need to address uh, the poverty of, particularly of women, as mentioned by Dr. Pernia. Poverty remains entrenched in our country, and even in the context of COVID-19, the inequalities have persisted. And so, uh, we really need to act collectively to uh, to help, especially the vulnerable sectors you mentioned. Uh, these are the women in the informal sectors not covered by social protection. And even in the context of this administration, the social protection has not really reached the most vulnerable. And I think at, more action should be done there. And uh, with Tati Likwanan, we are doing uh, our initiative to organize women and to advance this women's agenda. Because when we talk of poverty, it is a woman's face. The study led by uh, UP academics and other NGOs showed in the assessment of the UN Platform Action for Women, critical area number one, which is poverty, um, women remains the poorest of the poor. So Lisa, we need more robust data on what we mean by women still are the poorest of the poor in the country and in the world. And so yes, we need to do collective actions and as mentioned by Dr. Giselle, even uh, raising the political empowerment of women to decide the future of our country 
in the context of the much needed political change that we are facing in the forthcoming elections. So I take this opportunity to reach out to my colleagues and friends here. Let's help and come up with a more transformative change in the Philippines. Hello, Dr. Ernie. We are <laughs> retired but not tired yet, Dr. Ernie. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, Thank you very time. much. It was I, a very I, dynamic. I yeah. the, the next elections are really the most pivotal, the most crucial. And uh, I agree with Giselle, we should really exert every effort, every energy we have to help uh, get the, a better uh, national leadership. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. I think it was a very engaging discussion. And for those who want to stay behind to further discuss, I, I suppose we can also do that. But it's all it's already past 9.30. So let me just share my screen to promote the other activities of Paase. And we hope that, we, that you can join us in these activities, which will be happening on July 21, Wednesday. Um, this is organized by the Computer Science and Machine Learning and Artificial Intelligence Research Expertise Cluster. And then we have another one on August 6, which is a Paasa webinar, which, ha which will happen on a Friday at 8 a.m. If you want uh, more details of our engagement, please go to paase.org. And I'd like to invite everyone also that Paase will be coming, uh, will be having its um, and we'll pass a meeting and symposium. So we are calling for abstracts. The deadline has been extended to August 15. So please visit our website and I hope you can join us in all, all our future events. So thank you everyone again. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Lisa Bersales. Thank you uh, everyone and have a good day ahead. Bye. Thank you, Kay. Thank you, Giselle. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you,